saying, well, thank you very much for waking up this Friday morning and coming all the way to campus to listen to Dr. Elsa Boyd, who's coming especially from Glasgow. And I'm very happy to welcome Elsa Boyd, who is a, an independent uh, writer, lecturer, and creator of 19th century art, design, and literature. Elsa is currently researching a, prof, a prolific but relatively unknown Glasgow architect called Robert Duncan uh, and completing a monograph entitled Identity and Domestic Space in Victorian Literature, Houses and Fictions in George Eliot, Henry James and Edith Wharton. This explores the intersection of the real homes of the authors uh, with those they created in their fictions for their female characters against the vibrant background of the design reform movement in the latter part of the 19th century. Academic uh, publications include Beatrix Whistler, Manuals of Household Taste, The Afterlives of Henry James's Home uh, in Rye, and Edith Wharton's Approach to Interior Design. She recently uh, contributed a chapter on George Eliot at home, uh, to, uh, still crazy about George Eliot 200 years later, published in 2019. And she regularly lectures on Scottish art and artists, Glasgow history and architecture. So today, um, Elsa is going to tell us about uh, uh, George Eliot, Owen Jones, and uh, her paper is entitled Real Houses Fit for Human Beings, which I'm sure will be of uh, a great interest to many of you. Thank you again, and uh, the floor is yours, Elsa. Merci, thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me if I speak? Yeah. Lovely. Okay, so Real Houses Fit for Human Beings. This morning, I will discuss a very little known context to George Eliot's novels, interior design and architecture. In Middlemarch, Dorothea's aspiration to build happy homes for estate workers is no fad. And Eliot's use of architecture and interior design creates an intersection with character and the moral scheme of her novels. Eliot was friends with the architect and design reformer Owen Jones, who also decorated her home. This quote is Dorothea's fervent wish from Middlemarch, and the wallpaper design is by Jones from 1860. Along with many of their contemporaries, they believed that tasteful decoration had a beneficial effect on the health of society. Design reform was one of the discussions of the age for commentators like Pugin, Ruskin and Morris. Driven by their revulsion to modern industrial society, they scrutinised the production of the objects with which we decorate our homes, relating it to the health of society as a whole, paving the way for the famous arts and crafts movement of the 1880s. Eliot had a sophisticated understanding of these debates, and this paper will examine how the relationship of her characters to their homes fed into her themes of history, pi picturesqueness and poverty, and sympathy. So, George Eliot began her literary career as an, as an anonymous essayist and editor for the Westminster Review in 1852. Through this lively circle of radicals, philosophers and scientists, she met George Henry Lewis. They were unable to marry as he could not divorce his wife, but for 20 years theirs was a marriage in all but name. They supported each other emotionally and intellectually, enabling George Eliot to write her first fiction, Scenes of Clerical Life, in 1857. This was followed by Adam Bede in 1859, which was a huge success for the humanity and humour she brought to her realistic tales of the Midlands, with their strongly ethical, though not moralistic, tone. By the publication of her sixth novel, Middlemarch, in 1871-2, she was rightly known as the finest author of the age, with the success and fame to go with this social standing. But what has George Eliot got to do with interior design? Unlike Dickens, she is not known for highly de detailed descriptions of interiors and buildings, and her characters often shun the materialistic. But her interests in sociology, history, morality and character fit in with issues raised by the design reformers of the 1850s. 
This widespread cultural debate involved concerns over industrialisation and issues of style, morality and truth. It enabled the Victorians, in simple terms, to look at how you decorated your home and work out what sort of person you were. She engaged with these theories, providing a key to enable us to read the interiors and material culture of her novels as aspects of character, widening the socio-cultural context of her novels. Victorian architecture and design is well known for its historical styles like Gothic and medieval. Architects, designers and artists look to Britain's past to bolster feelings of national identity, to retreat from the modern industrial age and to find an authenticity of making they felt was being lost. Two of the key guides helping Victorians understand these different decorative languages were John Ruskin and Owen Jones. John Ruskin was one of the most important commentators of the age. He shaped how the Victorians looked at art and raised their awareness of, the value, of its value for a healthy society. Eliot reviewed his work and, like many others, took his books on foreign trips. However, The Stones of Venice of 1851 to 53 was not just a guidebook, but a socio-historical and political treatise against modern industrial society. For Ruskin, the decorative details of Gothic architecture based upon natural forms, I quote, afford means of expressing either symbolically or literally all that need be known of national feeling or achievement. He considered the Ducal Palace the central building of the world and his watercolours not only beautiful and atmospheric but carefully measured to record the decoration. Style is indivisible from the moral state of society and history could be read in the carved stone of the buildings. The final part of the Stones of Venice describes what he called the fall of the state into corruption and luxury in the 15th century. In architecture, this was matched by the increased use of classical orders over the organic, natural forms of medieval Gothic, as Ruskin saw it. He mapped this decline onto the 19th century, where classicism, the machine age and mercantile society were cutting Britain off from its own medieval past. He felt, I quote, a painful mercantile society, sorry, a painful foreboding that the roots of our national greatness must be deeply cankered when they are thus loosely struck in their native ground. Like AWN Pugin in his Contrasts of 1836, Ruskin uses examples from the past to criticise the values and architecture of the present. This concept was so well understood that when writing Daniel Deronda in 1876, Eliot similarly explained Gwendolen's deficiencies for, I quote, a human life, I think, should be well rooted in some spot of native land. We shall see later how the history of Britain confronts Gwendolen on her path to redemption. For Ruskin, this rootedness enabled artisans to fully express reverence for God's nature. He was able to put this into practice with the decoration of the Oxford Museum, a Gothic revival building designed by Benjamin Woodward. Ruskin raised funds and lectured to the workmen on site about working together as one man rather than machines. The stonemasons, the O'Shea brothers, carved British plants and flowers directly onto the columns from examples brought in by the museum keeper in accordance with Ruskinian principles. Eliot would have seen the museum on her visit to Oxford in 1870 and brings Ruskin's way of seeing into Daniel Deronda where the very structure and decoration of medieval Topping Abbey teaches young Daniel how to look at the world. I quote, after pointing out a lovely capital made by the curled leaves of greens, he tells Gwendolen, when I was a little fellow, these capitals taught me to observe and delight in the structure of leaves. In her review of Ruskin's Modern Painters, Volume 3, Eliot writes, the truth of infinite value that he teaches is realism, the doctrine that all truth and beauty are to be attained by a humble and faithful study of nature and not by substituting vague forms bred by imagination on the mists of feeling in a place of definite substantial reality. Ruskin's scrutiny of the relationship between art and truth was a major theoretical basis from which Eliot developed her doctrine of sympathy, the humanist philosophy that underpins all her novels.
Ruskin loved the picturesque architecture of continental Europe because the links are unbroken between the past and the present. We feel the ancient world to be a real thing and one with the new, he said. Eliot theorised this link in her 1856 essay, The Natural History of German Life, and gave it imaginative flight in the novel The Mill and the Floss in 1860. The long and rich history of St Ogg's is evidenced by its buildings. I quote, that venerable town carries the traces of its long growth on its aged fluted red roofs. She describes the modern part of the town in the rhetoric of design reform, its modern plate glass, stucco and other fallacious attempts to create incongruous new fashioned smartness. However, the inhabitants do not examine their history despite the physical evidence, I quote, they inherited a long past without thinking of it. They haven't been reading Ruskin, whose first major publication was in 1843, after the novel's time period. This is a good point at which to remind ourselves that Eliot mostly wrote historical fiction. Not only are we reading her novels some 160 years after they were written, but her first readers were being taken back in time as well to identify differences and similarities and chart the slow change of social history. Of the novels I'll be discussing, Scenes of Clerical Life and The Mill on the Floss are set during Eliot's own childhood in Nuneaton in the Midlands, where she grew up. Middlemarch is set 40 years before, just before the first Reform Act of 1832, which expanded the number of parliamentary seats and those who could vote for them. It was published just after the Second Reform Act of 1867, re encouraging reflection on the successes and failures of these two milestones. Daniel Deronda, however, is set only 10 years before and explores modern capitalism, imperialism and gender relations, and at the same time, the huge span of Jewish history. So let me look in a little more detail at some of these novels. So The Mill on the Floss tells the story of Maggie Tulliver's Maggie Tulliver, a vibrant, intelligent and emotional young girl who struggles against society's expectations of her, how she should behave, what she should do, who she, sh who she should love, and it all ends in tragedy. For the setting of one of its pivotal scenes, the charity Bazaar, Eliot was inspired by the old hall in Gainsborough, Lincolnshire. This timber-framed manor house was built in the late 15th century, with later parts added in brick and then stone. So we've got, I don't know if you can see, it's a bit dark, but we've got different bits here. We've got this timber framing, we've got a stone part here, and then it's a sort of C-shaped building with all these different parts added at different times and left to be added onto. In 1859, when Eliot visited, it was used as an assembly hall. It had been a private house. She describes that fine old hall which is like the town, telling of the thoughts and hands of widely sundered generations. She describes St Ogg's Hall as presenting the history of the town in its stones as a palimpsest. They who built the stone oriel and they who built the Gothic facade and towers of finest small brickwork with the trefoil ornament and the windows and battlements divine, defined with stone did not sacrilegiously pull down the ancient half-timbered body with its oak-roofed banqueting hall. In a scene full of watching during a charity bazaar, the layout enables a play of the gaze centred around Maggie. As John Berger describes, men act and women appear. Men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. At the bazaar, Maggie stands out as she is dressed in a plain muslin dress, but also due to her location in the Gothic stone oriel window, lit by stained glass, and that's here. So the glass is no longer coloured stained glass, but they have found pieces that were um, coloured, so it's possible that when Elliot visited that she saw some more bits of stained glass that have, re uh, that have disappeared in the time since. So she's standing in that window um, and she attracts the attention of men buying items from her stall and potential suitors, Stephen and Philip, both hidden behind curtains. Maggie is set apart by her coarse beauty, bold attitude and discourse with men, but also physically in this bay and by the coloured light bathing her in St Og's medieval history. Maggie, in the old hall, is a fixed point 
enabling multiple interpretations by her viewers. She is noble, beautiful, coarse, a commodity. By surrounding her with the history the townspeople ignore, but Ruskin had taught the readers of 1860 to see, we can read Maggie as set apart in her own space. Perhaps she is a medieval pre-Rephaelite stunner of the 1850s, like Millet's Mariana. But, more importantly for the reader in the 1860s, her direct gaze is outwards. She is a modern woman struggling under the weight of limited choices. The choices we make and how they can be influenced by the circumstance, family and society's expectations is one of the themes of Middlemarch. This masterpiece of provincial life is filled with references to modern science, biology, fashion, the classics, but also architectural and space metaphors and reactions to art and design. In her search for a purpose, young Dorothea's indefinite aspirations become crystallised in a plan to build cottages for the poor. Others think it is a fad, but the importance of the project was evident to Elliot, the estate manager's daughter. In her practical, direct way, Dorothea cries energetically that life in cottages might be happier than ours if they were real houses fit for human beings from whom we expect duties and affections. She goes on, I have been examining all the plans for cottages in Loudon's book and picked out what seemed the best things. I think instead of Lazarus at the gate, we should put the pigsty cottages outside the park gate. Rather than the beggar dying at the gate of the rich man in Luke 16:19, it's a perfect place for the poor to raise their own pigs. Her, her plans come from the recently published A Manual of Cottage Gardening, Husbandry and Architecture of 1830. And I hope you can see it's very, very tiny detail here. Um, but we've got plans of houses and the, um, the key to the plan underneath, which tells what every room should do. So in this book, Scottish landscape planner John Claudius Loudon published designs for model cottages. This family cottage has a wash house, cesspool, oven and flue, even a bee house and a pigeon place. Elliot would have been aware of Loudon through her father, Robert Evans, the Arbury estate manager. Loudon was one of the first architects who published useful, best-selling books that gathered and described practical designs and how much they cost. Dorothy is being very forward-thinking with her plans, for it was not until 1833 that Loudon published his monumental Encyclopedia of Cottage, Farm and Villa Architecture and Furniture, which was a popular vadimecum well into the 1880s. It's possible Elliot has mixed up the publication date for Middlemarch is set in 1829 to 32. Um, the his monumental encyclopedia is a pattern book with 2,000 illustrations for houses and garden. And it contained far more exam examples than the manual of all sorts of buildings by lots of different architects, including plans and elevations in various styles, designs for interior fittings and furniture, with Loudon's critical commentary. Dorothea's evangelical nature engages with poverty on a deep emotional and physical level. I used to come from the village with all that dirt and coarse ugliness, like a pain within me, and the simpering pictures in the drawing room seemed to me like a wicked attempt to find delight in what is false. With her plans to modify men's moods and habits and improve the lives of the poor through beautiful, if simple and practical surroundings, Dorothea anticipates the design and social reform movements of the 1870s. Many middle-class Victorian women found charity work a suitable outlet for their energies, but for Octavia Hill, improving the houses of, a poor, of the poor was a passion that became a profession. Hill began as an art pupil of Ruskin's, but in her early 20s moved from artistic work to what she called human work. In 1864, when this portrait drawing probably dates from, Ruskin invested in her plans to improve slum housing at the improbably named Paradise Place, which is on the right. She cleaned up three houses and made weekly visits to collect rent and check on issues. She utilised surplus rent to fund repairs, redecoration, even playgrounds, gardens and sewing classes to improve her tenants' lives. Famously, she stated in 1883, the poor of London need joy and beauty in their lives. 
Despite the rent being at the higher end, demand was high for homes under her successful system. Her women rent collector volunteers developed relationships with the tenants and took on a sort of social worker role, and eventually she managed nearly 2,000 homes across London. Hill achieved Dorothea's real houses fit for human beings from whom we expect duties and affections. For although her process was certainly paternalistic, as Ruth Livesey has pointed out, she pointed the way for today's social work and housing. Although 20 years younger than Eliot, Hill was one of her non-conformist intellectual friends. And Hill's sister Gertrude married Charles Lee Lewis, Eliot's stepson, in 1865. Hill was successful in gaining funds, funding from financiers to the aristocracy, including those in the arts. Eliot strongly approved of Hill's work and in 1874 contributed £200 toward a fund to enable the workaholic Hill to concentrate her energies in housing reform schemes. By the 1880s, she was building terraces of cottages with gardens, like Red Cross Cottages Southwark here in 1887. This was designed by Elijah Hu in a half-timbered red brick arts and crafts style. Each of the six cottages was meant to house a self-contained family and is distinguished from the others by the different patterns of brick and timbering. Both inspired by Ruskin, Hill and Hu worked together for 40 years creating decent homes which incorporated art and nature in their design. When George Eliot bought an arts and crafts country house in 1878, Hu was the architect in charge of renovations. Hill espoused Eliot's virtue of human sympathy and led by example, both to her tenants, to whom she demonstrated treating their homes and children with love, and to those at the other end of the social scale who supported her schemes financially. Hill wrote, Till you stay a little in the colourless, forlorn desolation of the houses in the worst courts, till you have lived among the monotonous, dirty tints of the poor districts of London, you little know what the colours of your curtain, carpets and wallpapers are to you. Ruskin's influence led Hill to believe that great art could evoke a profound emotional response, an associationist philosophy that we see affecting Dorothea on her honeymoon. For Puritan, generous-hearted Dorothea, the experience of St. Peter's in Rome is a cataclysmic assault on the senses on her disastrous honeymoon. Her ardent nature gave the most abstract things the quality of a pleasure or a pain, and her reaction is strong and physical. Baroque art, with its high colours and high emotions in the city of visible history, creates an oppressive masquerade of ages. Dorothea cannot read the art, for the narrator reminds us that 40 years ago, travellers did not often carry full information on Christian art, either in their heads or their pockets. Although from the previous century, this painting by Panini demonstrates the size of the basilica, the mixture of rich and poor life, the red and gold decorations that were such an assault. I quote, Titanic life gazing and struggling on walls and ceilings and the vastness of St. Peter's, the huge bronze canopy, the excited intention in the attitudes and garments of the prophets and evangelists in the mosaics above, it all brings Dorothea to tears. Her ability to feel deeply through visual stimuli is the other side of her emotional openness that will become sympathy. But to bring us safely back to the tangible, I will now introduce you to Eliot's own architect and friend, Owen Jones. Architect, designer and educator Owen Jones believed that a healthy society required good, honest and beautiful design. He was the superintendent of works for the Great Exhibition in 1851, where he controversially painted the interior ironwork of the Crystal Palace Exhibition Hall in bright colours. He knew from his studies of Chevreau's colour theory that this would enable the eye to better perceive the vast space. And you should be able to see just here, there's red predominantly on that arch and then blue on that arch, so you can see it. Um, I think it's even bigger than St. Peter's, the Crystal Palace was. His designs for the scrolls beneath those spandrels were not applied historicist ornament roiling around like the Baroque decorations of St. Peter's, 
but came from an understanding of the manufacturing and assembly process of modern wrought iron. He built houses and designed interiors and furniture for some of the richest people in Britain. But his commercial work included wallpaper, fabric, biscuit tins and playing cards. He experimented with modern techniques like chromolithography to publish books on the Alhambra and graphic design and created fantastical papier-mâché book covers. George Eliot's partner George Henry Lewis had known Jones since the 1850s when they both served on the committee of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts and Manufactures. Lewis contributed an essay to Jones's publication an apology for the colouring of the Greek court in 1854, which discussed the historical evidence of the original polychromy of Greek sculpture. The long and close friendship of Jones, Eliot and Lewis grew out of shared intellectual, scientific and aesthetic concerns. His modern scientific principles became highly influential in 1856 with the publication of The Grammar of Ornament. 37 general principles in the arrangement of form and colour were followed by 100 colour plates of ornament examples from around the world. The text describes how the exemplars could be used to create modern designs. Proposition 3, for example, identifies the essential elements for good design. As architecture, so all works of the decorative arts should possess fitness, proportion, harmony, the result of all which is repose. Jones took that most Victorian decorative idiom, the historical revival, and theorised, ordered and ratified its use. If we look at some of his wallpaper designs, we can see what he was doing that was different. This wallpaper, in the Gothic style, was chosen as an exemplar of bad design in 1851 by a committee including Jones and Henry Cole, the director of the new South Kensington Museum, which is now known as the V&A. As the label states, it exhibits the false principle of imitation of architecture. Jones didn't like it because of the three-dimensional jumble of Gothic arches and windows. It is neither a realistic scene like a painting or a flat pattern. It induces a kind of dizziness. Of course, there wasn't Gothic wallpaper. So on the left is a page showing wall diaper patterns he's copied from miniature scenes in 12th to 16th century illustrated manuscripts. On the right is stained glass from various churches, including Attenborough, York Cathedral and Canterbury. The artist is not limited to the original context of the examples for their own designs. And here you can see how he has taken how he has created his own fresh designs, probably a wallpaper design, this one. He has taken some of the basic language of the medieval patterns, but also what he's learnt from other cultures, like Islamic art. By introducing lines which carry the eye around the pattern and placing white next to various different colours, Jones creates a lively yet not too busy pattern, achieving his ideal of repose for the eye. The opposite effect would come from something like stripes and plaids on carpets and curtains because, as he says, the lines run in one direction only, carrying the eye right through the walls of the apartment. We can see what a revolutionary designer he was by comparing this wallpaper to a wallpaper by his friend A.W.N. Pugin. In the 1830s and 40s, Pugin led the Gothic revival with designs like the interiors of the Houses of Parliament, and this wallpaper is for Magdalen College, Oxford. Although Pugin was also no fan of the three-dimensional jumble of the first wallpaper, his design is heavily ornamented and detailed by using gilding, muted tones, heraldic imagery, crowns and shields. Pugin deliberately evokes the ancient past. Yet despite the Yorkist white rose, this is not an authentic medieval design. And we can identify this flock wallpaper as Victorian revivalist quite easily. However, Jones's paper could be put up in a home today without requiring a sense of irony, adhering as it does to eternally sound design principles. Jones hated the Gothic revival, saying it was the reproduction of a galvanised corpse. Progress would be better served, in his, 
in his opinion, by creating an architecture that was the true expression of the wants, the faculties and the sentiments of the age in which we live. So in 1856, George Eliot reviewed a reissue of what she called the Magnificent Book in the fortnightly review, demonstrating her complete understanding of design reform and agreement with its principles. She assigns physiological influences to the aesthetics of material culture and evanescent good taste, whatever that might be. The subtle relation between all kinds of truth and fitness in our life forbids that bad taste should ever be harmless to our moral sensibility or our intellectual discernment. And it is also probable that just colouring and lovely combinations of lines may be necessary to the complete well-being of our systems, apart from any conscious delight in them. Eliot's own stated aesthetic purpose was that, I quote, if art does not enlarge men's sympathies, it does nothing morally. In a review, she identifies a trickle-down effect in interior decoration. Fine taste in the decoration of interiors is a benefit that spreads from the palace to the clerk's house with one parlour. She gives all honour to Jones for his zealous vindication of internal ornamentation, often seen as a lesser art in comparison to architecture. He has laboured to rescue that form of art which is most closely connected with the sanctities and pleasures of our hearths from the hands of uncultured tradesmen. Eliot emphasises the closeness of the design of our homes to our very selves. The title, Grammar, describes Jones's method. The plates correspond to examples in syntax, not to be repeated parrot-like, but to be studies as embodiments of syntactical principles. For Eliot, design is just as scientific and based on laws as any of the other modern disciplines she was interested in, like sociology or physiology, and just as revolutionary, I quote, with the prospect of the unexhausted possibilities of freshness in design. Jones spoke more directly about interior decoration in a lecture in 1852, which was published in this volume, on the True and the False in the Decorative Arts in 1863, which is a collection of his lectures. He advises colours and treatments for walls, floors and ceilings and details of furniture, so the public may avoid decorating disaster. In his opinion, a man may do as much harm to society by building a house in bad taste as by openly violating some, at least, of the laws which society has established for regulating the morals. We've seen this sort of associationism in action in Eliot's novels. For the Victorians, morality and truth were inextricably connected with design. Let us see how all these ideas took physical shape in her own home. In 1863, George Eliot purchased the Priory in St John's Wood, London and employed Jones to decorate the drawing and dining rooms. This was where her famous Sunday afternoon salons would be held, which enabled her to enjoy society on her own terms, suited to her unusual domestic arrangements. As perhaps the richest novelist of the time, she reversed gender roles. She paid for the expensive decoration herself, and this included specially designed wallpaper. It was all a very difficult process, as Lewis describes in his diary, I quote, the piano tuner was sick over our elegant drawing room paper which Owen Jones had decorated and over the carpet. This obliges us to have fresh paper made as there are no remnants of the old and it was originally made for us. The idea of removal is too formidable. Jones did not undertake many private commissions, but his principles of colour and form are demonstrated in the many designs in the V&A archive, of which these are just a few examples. Jones would have respected his friend's unostentatious taste. And in his lecture, he recommends dull reds or greens for the study or dining room, but drawing rooms may be more gay, almost any tone and shade of colour, perhaps heightened with gold, as long as the balance was maintained, like this green wallpaper at the top right. When living in lodgings in 1860, Eliot wrote to Sarah Hennell, in our own drawing room, I mean to have a paradise of greenness. Jones liked the ceiling to be more elaborately, elaborately decorated, particularly in dining rooms where seated guests will have more convenience for examining it. 
At top left is a delicate painted ceiling design in red and blue with foliate patterns. In fact, lots of Jones's designs in the archive that you think at first might be a carpet are probably ceiling designs. This basket great fireplace at bottom right with delft tiles is a consciously 18th century design, evoking a simpler time before adjustable register grates. Jones's aim was to create a harmonious effect where the dominant colour must be broken either in shade or in light to achieve repose to the eye. Although the profusion of patterns may seem overwhelming to us, in 1863 this was the most fashionable good taste, embodying truth to materials based on nature and history without pretentious glittering facsimile. Elliot told her friend Cara Bray that they were enjoying the prettiness of colouring and arrangement of their new home and that Jones had determined every detail so that we can have the pleasure of admiring what is our own without vanity. Her own home may be filled with beautiful things, but she can derive pleasure without guilt because her artistic friend has fulfilled his principles and made the drawing room in which I sit thoroughly harmonious. This engraving of Elliot's drawing room is from some years later, unfortunately, after Jones had died and the room had been redecorated by the arts and craft designer Basil Champneys in 1875. So it doesn't demonstrate Jones's original design very well. However, the room retains such reformed elements as simple curtain rails. So we've just got a rail here with uh, um, brass hooks and um, so there's no fussy lombrequins over the windows. The furniture isn't overstuffed. We've got a basket grate in the fireplace like the one we just saw. And there are hints of foliage on the wallpaper. It has to be said that when Basil Champneys redecorated it, um, it was 20 years later. And it probably would have had more of an arts and crafts William Morrissey look, which would have been more up to date at that time. But there, there is a, a line of design, reform design, which goes through. So a visitor in 1868 described the drawing room having a character of refined simplicity. There is nothing pretentious. The furniture is simple and modest, yet there is a harmony of colour which pleases the eye. We can compare some of the items here with those in museums that once belonged to Elliot. The barley sugar leg table is perhaps one of those from her friend Elma Stewart, who made several wood carved gifts for Elliot. And it's difficult to tell what's above the fireplace, whether it's a mirror or a painting. And here are examples of both from Nuneaton Museum, which include a gift from Sir Frederick Burton. As with most people's houses, the Priory is full of items with sentimental value from friends and family. Elliot and Lewis also both went to auctions and the Army and Navy store to buy second-hand furniture. These are rather contrasting, unreformed rooms. At top right, an exemplar middle-class drawing room in a museum where the heavy red velvet and shiny rosewood furniture, the flowers under glass and sentimental engravings are rather different to Jones's ideal. It's very similar to this famous pre-Raphaelite painting which demonstrates not only the terrible morality tale of the kept woman, but the modern furniture in a Greek revival style probably bought from the uncultured tradesman with a profusion of mirrors and a brocaded lambrequin at the window. Ruskin famously described this painting in moral terms. There is not a single object in all that room, common, modern, vulgar, but it becomes tragical if rightly read. That furniture so carefully painted, even to the last vein of the rosewood, is there nothing to be learnt from the terrible lustre of it, from its fatal newness, nothing there that has the old thoughts of home upon it, or that is ever to become part of a home? Elliot explores the old thoughts of home in Middlemarch, where characters like the Garths and Fairbrothers live in faded gentility, surrounded by history and family memory in their furniture. I quote, we get the fonder of our houses if they have a physiognomy of their own, as our friends have. By the 1870s, when Middlemarch was published, decorating using a carefully selected mixture of historical antiques, picturesquely arranged with objects from around the world, was thoroughly fashionable. 
1878 painting demonstrates aesthetic or artistic style. It is characterised by a mixture of antiques and foreign items with designs from modern artists as well in muted colours. The history of all cultures is demonstrated by beautiful things. 18th century Chippendale style chairs, an Indian inspired paisley shawl, blue and white Chinese porcelain, Japanese fans, old English brass platters and a Persian rug. The wallpaper is a flat design of foliage by Charles Eastlake, another design reformer, and the painted glass casts a warm glow on the organist in her 18th century style clothes. In Eliot's novels, the homes of morally admirable characters often demonstrate the importance of history in their contents, along with the values of honesty, generosity and humanity. Reverend Fairbrother's old-fashioned parlour is filled with furniture and pictures with another grade of age layered upon them. Even the layout is of the last century, with uneasy chairs set against the wall, as we have here. They demonstrate the patina of age with some lingering red silk damask with slits in it. Eliot further articulates this aesthetic of age with an understanding of historical distance, memory and rootedness. Perhaps this is the best home in the novel, matriarchal, simple and sustaining. For Fairbrother embodies emotional farsightedness and generosity. He gives good advice to all and with his sister propels the love plot towards resolution. In Daniel de Ronda, Eliot highlights another topical architectural issue with a discussion on authenticity and restoration. Topping Abbey has been built on the site and ruins of a pre-Reformation monastery, the violent origin of so many English country houses. Eliot describes the confrontation of old and new in the refectory, now the dining room, where Gwendolyn shudders at thinking of angry, ghostly monks. One of Eliot's inspirations was Laycock Abbey in Wiltshire, originally a 13th century nunnery, with many alterations over the years. Like Topping, Laycock has a wonderfully preserved cloister. In the 1870s, it was the home of photographic pioneer William Henry Fox Talbot, whose 1844 book The Pencil of Nature was the first to demonstrate the potential of pr printing photographs from negatives. And there's a bit of a fight going on between whether Henry Fox Talbot or uh, Daguerre was the first person to invent photography. Um, Talbot didn't um, publicise his early discoveries as much. And the front cover of his book, The Pencil of Nature, was a chromolithograph designed and printed by Owen Jones. The kitchen at Topping has shadowy stone walls and groined vault it has limestone walls which are romantically defaced by age. Most unusual is the conversion of a small chapel into stables. Each finely arched chapel was turned into a stall where in the dusty glazing of the windows there still gleamed patches of crimson, orange, blue and palest violet. This rather startling effect created by Reformation troops is an inescapable confrontation with the building's history. Sir Hugo continues its sacrilegious use, but with modern improvements, renewing the paving with drainage according to the most approved fashion. Yet, the space retains its mystical power, with Gwendolyn exclaiming, Oh, this is glorious, while Deronda automatically removes his hat. Throughout topping, ancient fragments are placed beside new. Sir Hugo explains his very modern theory of renovation. The notion of reproducing the old is a mistake, he says. Additions ought to smack of the time when they are made and carry the stamp of their period, rather than hiring men to scratch and chip it all over artistically. This is why he did not change the use of the chapel, it having been a stable for 300 years. His argument echoes the architects involved in the ecclesiology movement of the 1860s and 1870s who were dismayed by recent extensive church restorations that destroyed the original fabric. In the process, creating buildings untruthful in layout and materials, thus obscuring history. They were inspired by Ruskin's unequivocal view that restoration means the total destruction which a building can suffer, accompanied with false description of the thing destroyed. 
This led to the foundation of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings in 1877 by designer William Morris and architect Philip Webb, among others. Their manifesto calls for architects to put protection in the place of restoration and otherwise to resist all tampering with either the fabric or ornament of the building as it stands because modern art cannot meddle without destroying. Astley Castle is a recent example of this type of restoration. A 13th century fortified manor house in Nuneaton, Warwickshire. It is near where Elliot grew up and part of the Arbury estate which her father managed. It is said to be the model for Nebley Abbey in the scenes of clerical life. Uninhabited since a fire in 1878, the Landmark Trust undertook this dramatic restoration which won the Stirling Prize for Architecture in 2013. You can see the cle clear demarcation between the ancient and the modern through the use of different but sympathetic materials and a repurposing of space, here creating a double height dining room within the ruins of two rooms. Daniel Deronda is just one of many characters looking for a home in the novel. He is the wandering Jew searching for his own true heritage. He is sustained but not bound by the past. I quote, to delight in doing things because our fathers did them is good if it shuts out nothing better. It enlarges the range of affection and affection is the broadest basis of good in life. As for all that his upbringing at Topping means to him on his travels, I carry it with me, he says. History, design, architecture and surroundings are foundational elements of Eliot's doctrine of sympathy, of which he is the epitome. Daniel had the stamp of rarity in a subdued fervour of sympathy, acts of considerateness that struck his companions as moral eccentricity. He is designed as the moral lodestone of the book, and for Gwendolyn, for he, he's the moral lodestone for Gwendolyn as well, for she learns through his sympathy how to continue with her life after her terrible choices. This ghostly image is one of the earliest photographic negatives ever taken by Fox Talbot at Laycock, the inspiration for topping. If we think back to Maggie standing in the light of the oriel window in St Og's old hall, poised between the future and the past, this photograph captures that moment. Natural light flooding through the ancient oriel window in April 1839 has created a print on the paper Talbot prepared using salt. This is a new medium for the modern age, which, 180 years later, I am projecting digitally with light, having found it on the internet catalogue Rizzoni of Talbot's work, which is accessible to all. In the 1860s to 70s, when Eliot was writing her great novels, design reform was one of the major discussions of the age. In reaction to the fast pace of modern industry, commentators like Ruskin and Jones scrutinise the production of, of the objects with which we decorate our homes, relating this to the health of society as a whole. Eliot's use of interiors and architecture reveals a profound engagement with the domestic interior and a sophisticated understanding of these debates, adding a further layer of understanding to her novels and the Victorian architecture and decoration that still survives throughout Britain. Thank you very much. <laughs>